X, it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Angela Valenzuela. Dr. Valenzuela is a professor in the Educational Policy and Planning Program within the Department of Educational Policy at the University of Texas at Austin and holds a, a courtesy appointment in the Cultural Studies and Education Program within the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, also at UT Austin. She also serves as a director of the University of Texas Center for Education Policy. Please welcome Dr. Angela Valenzuela. All right, how's everybody doing? All right, I'm glad. So uh, I wear a lot of hats, and I want to just it'll, explaining this will make uh, the presentation make sense. But uh, I work at the national level on uh, a Grow Your Own project, Grow Your Own Educator project, and uh, 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 Dr. Lindsay suggested that as an important remedy to enhancing the representation of teachers of color in the profession. Um, I'm also involved uh, nationally in uh, the um, fight for ethnic studies, uh, including the uh, famous court case out of the University of Arizona that involved the dismantling of Mexican American studies. And uh, fortunately, we just won that, that court case with the, um, I was one of three expert witnesses, um, and it was uh, about a seven year trial. Um, but um, um, we won that court case, and so that's a very significant victory for the nation to have won a, uh, one of very few battles on curriculum, maybe not, maybe not since the Scopes trial. I'm dating myself here, but some of you might, that might come to mind. So a lot's going on, and uh, it would be nice to, you know, like for you to think about what can be done here locally in light of what I'm sharing, uh, and it's not just going to be sort of a laying out of what's going on, but, but really some of the cutting edge thinking uh, on, on the matter that I think inspires the movement and that, that motivates it. So what I want to accomplish today is to, you know, really think about ways of knowing and, uh, you know, indigeneity and, and, and we must know, we, we must embrace that we're always on uh, native land, right? We are never not on native land. Um, uh, there didn't used to be a place called North America or the United States or even Latin America, South America. It had a name, okay? It had names. We were in Turtle Island, right? It, uh, we're on Abya Yala. I mean, there's different names for the continent. But uh, indigenous epistemologies means rethinking, you know, rethinking these kinds of things. I want to talk about uh, vocabulary so that we can uh, uh, talk to each other about, you know, how to move forward. There's also important evidence, some of which has already been um, uh, covered with related to ethnic studies, and, um, and also a little bit on the movement. And um, a lot of what I'm reading right now is on uh, the colonial matrix of power, and it's these scholars, um, it, it's these scholars who are you know, really thinking about uh, these really grand um, narratives that exist, these epic narratives that, that we just have to challenge, right? The social studies curriculum, I think, is part of the colonial matrix of power because it doesn't allow us to, to breathe and have a, an independent kind of you know, inquiry that's very um, situated in, um, in, in this land and on this continent. Uh, this involves a, a philosophically um, addressing the, the Descartian ego of subject-object relations, and, um, and also in policy. I'm also in policy, and how do we move forward in policy uh, to establish, uh, on the one hand, uh, ethnic studies and also growing our own educators. I also like to have fun, okay? So, y'all like to have fun? Everybody likes to have fun. <laughs> I don't have another life, right? And so, um, I, I think it'll, it'll show in a little bit. I think you'll hear some bells and whistles on this. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, here, this is really important. The real justification for including Aboriginal knowledge in the modern curriculum is not so that Aboriginal students can compete with non-Aboriginal students in an imagined world. It is rather that immigrant society, all non-Aboriginal peoples, is sorely in need of what Aboriginal knowledge has to offer. So we're in a moment of definition right now. It's exciting. It's really exciting to be part of this moment. It's a fight for our children, our youth, our, our languages, our cultures. Uh, it's for respectful inclusion in state curricula. Um, I mean, it's just really stunning when I think about it that in Texas, it was just a, a couple of months ago, literally, that the Texas State Board of Education 
uh, uh, basically acknowledged the teaching of slavery in our curriculum, right? I mean, if you keep up with the State Board of Education, yes, the famous ignominious one that has been, you know, very um, uh, in the news about its different uh, battles. But this battle, this, it was barely won. I mean, to me, that's ridiculous that this battle was barely won. And, and they were wanting to, you know, put forward, uh, you know, sectionalism and state rights as the reason for, as, as the reason for the Civil War. When, you know, I mean, that happened, but it was slavery was was the reason for the Civil War. And so these have to do with emotional connections to a certain mythic past, a certain kind of history that that uh, preserves white dominance, white hegemony, white power. So it's a, a fight for our indigenous epistemologies. That's a fancy word for ways of knowing. Our ways of knowing is ways of being in the world. Um, it's um, something that we talk a lot about in grad school, but it's something that we try to live in the ethnic studies movement. So ethnic studies is an umbrella term, um, and it really just takes shapes based on uh, history and the different kinds of opportunities locally uh, uh, across the nation. But it, uh, you know, roughly includes these areas, African American studies, Asian American studies, uh, Boricua, Puerto Rican studies, Dominican studies, Mexican American studies, Asian American studies, Native American and indigenous studies, and women and gender studies. And sometimes it's intersectional or it's interdisciplinary. You'll have, I think you have that here at the University of uh, uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. You have an intersectional kind of, kind of program that fac with faculty that teach uh, across these categories, across these areas. It's also typically located in either uh, liberal arts or humanities or uh, uh, in, the, in the social sciences. But, uh, but there's also a, um, a growth of ethnomathematics and ethnoscience. It's really exciting stuff. I mean, I mean check it out. Uh, the Mayan abacus is being taught right now as a tool, a teaching tool. Uh, yes, it reduces the, you know, the achievement gap, but more than anything, it promotes a love of, of uh, mathematics, and it's being done in Los Angeles and in, um, in San Antonio schools. The Mayan abacus, I mean, the Mayans and the Aztecs, they needed technology, right, to build their pyramids. I mean, if we can make it to, you know, to the moon on a slide rule, I mean, it, it, it makes sense that, that, uh, that you can have an abacus that can build you, build you a, a, an empire. Uh, and, and it's just so affirming for the kids in these programs to get this curriculum. Um, it, ethnic studies, it, it, uh, it's just another name for what used to be called multicultural education at the K-12 level, but it's the same, it's the same thing, uh, and that's its own history, um, and it, of course, it has this uh, spectrum uh, where it, it goes from you know, kind of the heroes and holidays approach, right, to kind of the more critical, the more critical approaches. Uh, so when it's done well, it's, it's an ethnic studies program that's aligned to what is done at the university. So if you know anything about Arizona and the Tucson Unified School District, what made it so powerful was that there was a very close connection and alignment uh, between the University of Arizona Tucson and the Tucson Unified School District, and it was deep, and it was uh, had to do with a, a teacher preparation and curriculum development that was ongoing. It was very, um, very in depth uh, of a kind of a partnership that uh, that we in the Grow Your Own Educator movement uh, definitely advocate for. So there's different kinds of of approaches. Uh, they can all be done very well, okay. Um, but but uh, I think in general it would be the single the ones that align to a field of study like African American studies, like Native American and indigenous studies, if it aligns to a field of study, it tends to be a better, the strongest approach. Again, because it's, it, it aligns to a field, to a field of study, and so it's in-depth, and um, uh, it can provide uh, oftentimes better uh, you know, frameworks. This isn't the study of ethnics, right? This is, this is, this is, uh, these are approaches to knowledge that are interdisciplinary, that offer theoretical frameworks that help us uh, deconstruct all of these things that we've been talking about, having to do with race, racism, uh, white privilege, uh, you know, how people are organized and stratified in society, and what are the historical and sociological and political bases for, um, uh, for, for, for the stratification that we just breathe. It's just the air that we breathe, that we don't even question it sometimes. And, and so we need to, to, to do that in a, in a uh, ideally in a uh, systemic kind of way, systematic. So the infusion approaches can be done very well. Um, that's what the Austin Independent School District has right now. Uh, I was on the committee for that curriculum. At the same time that we're developing ethnic studies, we're addressing Arizona, um, you know, but we're also locally working on it. And, um, 
And so it's uh, more of a thematic comparative and it al aligns roughly to um, Hispanic heritage and African American heritage, the different months and it's got two parts and in the, in the, in the B part, the, the, the second semester, that's when you can do the project-based learning, the authentic assessment kind of stuff that, that makes school so enriching, the, um, you know, the really great kinds of um, uh, inquiry-based uh, opportunities that, that young people can, can um, can do that speak to their own personal story. So it's not limited to these groups, but it can be an, an opening, a, a vehicle for looking at, uh, at, at, at all groups, at, at, at many groups. Uh, the comparative is the AISD model I just mentioned, um, and it's a very good curriculum. It's done very well. And we're happy, I, I'm happy to share that curriculum with you. We need more help on the Native American and, and indigenous uh, part of it, and I think that's you know, a, a hole that we're gonna have in a lot of places, um, you know, really because of the subordination of um, of indigenous perspectives, voices, people um, in the um, in the academy and beyond. So ethnic studies, um, this is what the research says. Uh, Dr. Lindsay mentioned the Thomas D study, so you'll see D and Penner, and this is a, a research out of the San Francisco school district. You've got the Cabrera out of the Tucson Unified School District. They did roughly comparative kinds of analyses, and and uh, what was really amazing is that. Um, uh, you know, the state, they hired their own um, witness to represent uh, them, you know, the state of Arizona. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the scholar who, you know, was, was hired by the state to represent uh, the state side uh, was, was, you know, in, in every way possible just trying to, um, to take apart, um, I think unsuccessfully, Nolan Cabrera's research and Cabrera and colleagues. And uh, he finally just threw up his, his hands um, in the middle of the trial and he says, well, it, you know, if these numbers are true, this should be happening everywhere. Yeah, it should be happening everywhere. And, and so what you have are, are students who for the first time in their lives feel part of the, the grand American narrative, right? We've heard today that the importance uh, throughout many presentations, the importance of belonging, that sense of belonging, that's so essential. No, they're not, they don't wanna uh, you know, destroy the American government. It's not about that. It would have happened a long time ago, by the way, if that's what, uh, what uh, was really being uh, demanded here. This, this movement goes back at least in terms of, you know, like what we might call ethnic studies, at least back to the late 60s and early 70s. Although if we think of W.E.B. Du Bois, if we think of, of African Afrocentric schools, uh, uh, the escuelitas in the, uh, the little schools in the Mexican American communities that taught in Spanish, that taught that, you know, the history, the local histories, it, it's a much older, it's probably one that, that uh, has always been around. It has always been with us, but it's been muted, right? It's been a muted kind of discourse, a muted kind of agenda. So those are some of the, if you want to take a picture of that, those are some of the ma major, not all of them, but they were very important in the trial, in the Tucson Unified School District trial. The uh, judge, uh, D Judge Wallace Tashima, ultimately ruled against it, saying, uh, against uh, the state, saying that, uh, that there was racial animus involved against uh, the teachers and the students in the dismantling of this program. So that was a significant victory. I mean, what, you know, what are the overarching goals? It's, de it's decolonizing knowledge. It's liberating ways of knowing and being in the world. It's epistemic justice. I mean, you have a, a right to, to know and experience life as you know and experience it and as you want to experience it as, as, as communities, right? And I'll give you a flavor of what we're doing of that in, in Austin soon. It's about, it's about, uh, about individual transcendence. It's about community transcendence. Why can't we in our educational experience experience that? Right? Why can't we experience transcendence? Why are we reduced to numbers on a piece of paper? Why are we objectified, treated like objects? And children feel like their, their worth extends you know, precious little far beyond, further beyond that number on a piece of paper, right? And you know, my college students feel that. My college, they, they often talk about being objectified and, and that, that the kinds of experiences that they have at the graduate level are oftentimes just very alienating. Right? And, and, and we all want to be cared for and cherished and appreciated for, for the, 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 the diversity, the value that we add. We all want that and we all have so much to add, right? And to live in a world with no dispossession. So this is the contemporary ethnic studies movement really quickly, Arizona. I've been speaking about that. If you haven't seen the film Precious Knowledge, I strongly encourage that you see that film, um, Precious Knowledge. Did you see, did you, how many have seen the film Precious Knowledge? Oh, it's an amazing film, um, and uh, it's really 
really, really powerful. I think it's one of the best films out there on uh, the ethnic studies movement in Arizona, but just as a whole. Uh, this is the, the Arce v. Douglas court case. This is a, in, in the, uh, the glow of uh, victory. <laughs> it's just fun. I thought I had sound effects, okay? I thought you got the version here with the sound effects. I had applauses and everything. It was, it was awesome. I'm sorry. Um, there, there was, it, it motivated. Uh, there, I mean, there's definitely a connection with what happened in Arizona, with what happened in, in California, uh, in uh, Texas. Uh, one of our good friends, Tony Diaz, he started a book trafficking, Libro Traficante book movement, trafficking in the books that had been uh, sealed up and taken away from the students and the teachers because um, uh, in 2012, January 2012, the program became illegal, li literally illegal. And so uh, there, he had a lot of um, uh, media attention. In New Mexico, we have a couple of bills. Um, it, it still hasn't gotten through, but there's a, a definite legislative support for ethnic studies. I think it got past the House in the last, last time, and so it's gonna be coming again through the House and the Senate. Um, in Colorado, same deal, it's in process. Uh, we've got our champions there, uh, Salazar Moreno, who have a House bill uh, that, that uh, is pushing for um, ethnic studies. There's uh, also Kansas, the State Board of Education, it's working with uh, state leaders on a seven to 12 curriculum, and they haven't been able to get it passed for three years now so far that they've been working on it in the Kansas State Legislature, but uh, apparently the, uh, the, the Department of Education in Kansas wants to work more closely with the community to see what, what can be leveraged to develop curriculum in, in uh, uh, ethnic studies um, and to uh, prepare teachers to teach it. Oregon um, is the only state right now in the nation that makes uh, the K-12 ethnic studies a requirement for graduation from high school. Uh, and interestingly enough, they have a, an infusion approach, so it's still uh, getting um, developed, but, uh, but the idea is like every course should have, or as many courses as possible, should have ethnic studies content within them. And I think partly that reflects on the kinds of resources that they have available um, uh, in Oregon. Uh, I mean, that's what happened in AISD. We developed this kind of infusion curriculum because we only had like isolated individuals teaching, you know, one section of African American studies, another section of, of Native American and Indigenous, another section. I mean, so it was just, we, you know, they brought everybody together to, to form a, a, an, a, an, a thematic comparative curriculum. Um, in California, so Assembly Bill 2722, uh, it, it actually made it to the governor's desk. He didn't approve it, but he does allow districts throughout the state to make ethnic studies a requirement for graduation. And theirs is more like a, you know, they develop curriculum frameworks. If you look at the frameworks for the state of California that I've seen right now, it's um, uh, the Holocaust and uh, Cesar Chavez. They do a good job. Um, they do a really good job. And, uh, and I trust that they'll do a good job as they develop their own, their own frameworks. Um, Texas is the only state, and this was uh, in the uh, June uh, 2018 meeting of the State Board of Education, after a four-year battle of trying to get um, ethnic studies uh, according to these fields of studies passed is, is when it all played out, when it all happened. And so uh, that's a winding story. Um, uh, I have a blog, if any of you want to keep up with any of this uh, just type my name in Google and blog, and it'll be the first thing that comes up. But uh, but it's been a very difficult story. I think you see me down there. I'm a little angry. Um, <laughs> it was this racist textbook that was supposed to be for this course that we were trying to um, uh, get the State Board of Education to pass. And it was horrible. It was an awful textbook that uh, was called Mexican American Heritage, and it it, uh, it suggested that uh, that they were you know as Mexican Americans a threat. Did you did you catch any wind of that? Uh, anyone from Texas? And it, yeah, yeah, so, so now we've got Dallas and um, Fort Worth that are uh, uh, advocating for ethnic studies right now in the uh, school district. So it really, it's interesting because these battles motivate these counter, these counter battles, just like Arizona. They did, it, they did that for all of us. And this is us, the school board, this is our victory. It's just so nice uh, to celebrate uh, what we're able to accomplish. And I mean, you know, you've got, you've got just these great uh, opportunities and hopes, and we're already looking anecdotally at the impacts of the curriculum on the students, and they love it. I mean, the students love it, and uh, it doesn't make them come out, you know, angry. I mean, it's hard not to get angry sometimes, but uh, it's just, again, that, that feeling of finally being respected and included, and that your own story matters. That's so important. 
So, the, so it, I, mean, I mean, as far as the scholars are concerned, those of us, um, you know, many of us who are in the field, we're looking at, at uh, curriculum, uh, the hegemonic uh, Eurocentric curriculum, uh, uh, the social studies curriculum, you know, the social studies, we didn't used to teach social studies this history, and it, and it tracks back to the Native American Indian school boarding experience. That's when social studies came into existence. So it was part, it was always part of, uh, of disciplining. It wasn't just a discipline, but it was disciplining the, uh, the identities, uh, just like the Americanization project, just like the assimilation projects have always been about the disciplining of students of color into an Anglo way of knowing and thinking about the world, right? Including the speaking of the English language. And it doesn't mean that, you know, Spanish isn't the same way. Spanish is a colonizer's tongue as well, right? Spanish, um, uh, it, it undermined native tongues and native languages, right? And so uh, a lot of our work also is about recovery. I think therefore I am is a very important concept uh, because uh, what you see is just this, uh, this relationship between um, self and other that, is, it, that externalizes, right? And so when I talk about, as I've said just now, about objectification, objectifying children and treating them like kids in numbers, that's what's happening with the Dakarshan ego. And, and, and so it's, and why is it an I and why isn't it a we? Why is it, you know, why is nature not in the, you know, in the, um, in this idea? This is an idea that goes back to the Enlightenment, right? 300 years ago. But before that, it, 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 it built on the whole uh, colonization project, the colonial project. And where's nature? And where's spirituality? And where's the body, right? And so we get a lot in the head and, and we, uh, uh, I think, Lindsay, you talked about obesity, right? I mean, wh what are we doing with the body? And what are we doing with the environment? And why aren't we doing, we had a co conversation over lunch, why aren't we doing anything about the environment? Have y'all seen, or, or very little in our public education, have you, seen the, have you seen or caught wind of the reports that come out under Trump's administration recently on uh, just how precarious things are with our, our natural environment? It's, uh, it's pretty shocking. And to think that we're not even part of that conversation is, uh, is really, really, Terrible. And so, I mean, you can't have modernity, you know, the scholarship, I mentioned it earlier, Lujones, um, that you can't have modernity without coloniality, and you can't have coloniality without modernity. So the reason you have anything that's, that's you know, that's modern is because of, um, of the colonial relationship to, um, to Western Europe. I mean, that's how modernity comes into existence. And so you have Westernization as, as the flip side to coloniality. Progress as the flip side to, to slavery and to conquest. And I mean, what we call progress is, uh, it's uh, exploitative. It, 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 uh, it's, it's typically um, ab about uh, extraction and um, you know, basically divesting people of their homes and properties. We're, we have this major problem with gentrification right now in our school district. Major, major problem. I know this happening across the country, right? And so, uh, well, that's a colonial, you know, it's funny, but, but in Spanish, uh, it, it, you call it colonización. So, están colonizando, that means they're gentrifying. It's the same word uh, in Spanish. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know, you have this idea of uh, salvation, individualism, white supremacy, exceptionalism. Texas exceptionalism is a big, a, a big idea in Texas. You can laugh if you want, okay? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it is. It is a big deal. It is a really big deal. Well, where does this come from? Well, this comes from this linear way of thinking, the Cartesian, you know, from Descartes. So it's like, it's, it's hierarchical. I remember in Western Europe, it was feudal. Right? It was, a, it was, a, it was, it was, there was feudalism, right? So very, very hierarchical. It's linear. So when they come to this continent and they see indigenous people and it's, it's a collaborative and it's ceremonial and it, and you, and you uh, exist in circles, right? You, you, you govern in circles and you do danza and ceremony in circles. It became illegal to, to uh, even gather in a circle. And that's when lines came into existence on this continent. You had to get in your, in, in your line, uh, stay in your lane, you know, don't move from it. Don't we do that every day in public education? Is, is put kids in lines? Don't we do that? Yeah, every single day in public education. Well, that has a root. And that goes back to a way of knowing that actually is provincial from Western Europe. But it assumed this grand status globally because of capitalism, because of, uh, of Western expansion and capitalism. But if you think about Western Europe, there were other totalities. You had the, the Asian dynasty that were coterminous, right? You had the Asian dynasties. You had the, you know, the, the Islamic 
uh, caliphates. You had all of this stuff, but it was one group that comes into power that ends up um, assuming world, world dominance and imposing a way of knowing. So European rationality associated with the emergence of capitalist relations engendered ranking, hierarchy, linear thinking, and objectification, right? And, the ex and so this is the extreme impact of colonization, that we could treat any of these children and that we can treat these families, right, in our minds, in our hearts, in our data, in our thinking, in our way of being, as not just systems, but as individuals in those systems every single day who are um, uh, administering, right? But what, well, what is it to administer? What is it to administer you know, the ghetto in Warsaw, right? What is it, you know, what is that? And what point is it no longer actually administering, but it's actually, it's actually resulting in, in tremendous harm, but also reinscribing the colonial matrix of power, right? I mean, this is really deep, right? And it, it involves, so it's not just like learning new information, it's actually like thinking differently about everything that we learn, right? That is the challenge, and, and I, you know, it's my challenge too, it's my journey. So we have to liberate the production of knowledge, reflection, and communication from the pitfalls of European rationality. So it, we will have failed if ethnic studies fails to do this. And, and that's why it's under attack, but you know what? It's good medicine. It is good medicine for all of us. So decolonized knowledge by you know, getting back to the roots of struggle, relational epistemology, just how, how we be, how we relate, you know, indigenous ways of knowing, uh, building institutions in the community, and really centering our reform in the community, right? And so, I mean, this is awesome to have a foundation that, that uh, is, is about that. Well, you know what? This is where it has to go. And, th and it has to even be anchored in there, and you anchor it through partnerships. Right, and and, and these are formal legal. These aren't like you know pie in the sky things, and, and it's and it's very relational. It's very granular, and you take back control in these ways. Right, you take back control of the knowledge, and you democratize curriculum. You develop curriculum that that speaks directly, and it comes out of directly the experiences of the people in your community. And you grow your own educators. You don't have to outsource. Right, you can insource. <laughs> so this is a, a book uh, that, that lays out our methodology, if any of you are interested. Um, this is the National Latino Education Research and Policy Project. And uh, we have uh, initiatives from throughout the country. Um, one in Dallas, uh, Sacramento, Chicago, uh, Illinois, um, and uh, New York. And then locally. We have a, a Grow Your Own Project locally. I'm gonna get to that. All right, that's who we are. Academia Cuautli, it's Nahuatl for Eagle Academy. Uh, we love the eagle. I mean, the eagle's amazing, an amazing, it's, it's, it's like one of the universal symbols that, uh, that uh, means resurrection. And one thing that, uh, that we knew when we started our academy uh, in 2013, when we started our, our regular meetings in the community, after our teachers told us that they don't have curriculum, they don't have books, we're supposed to be a dual language district and we don't have stuff in English or Spanish. Well, we took it upon ourselves to, um, to help them, right? And, um, and so we knew that uh, we would have to um, ourselves be renovated, ourselves be renewed, or else who's gonna wanna come to our school? <laughs> who's gonna wanna even be part of us, right? So we have a Saturday Academy, a Saturday Academy, Academia Cuautli, uh, and we, it's every day, uh, every Saturday of the year. Um, and we serve uh, children from uh, six schools, Sanchez, Metzavala, Houston, and Pettis Elementary. And what we do is we um, develop curriculum and make it available district-wide. So um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, that's, that's who we are. We serve uh, Title I schools. Title I and Title III have funded uh, this. It pays for the teachers, the buses, the books, uh, the curriculum, and then we raise our own money independently of that for incidentals. Um, we serve bilingual education teachers, mostly those associated with the Austin Area Association for Bilingual Education. And what's really nice is that the, the ABE teachers as well are, are getting very um, mobilized and uh, they have their annual conference. And so they themselves are, are uh, also uh, in serving Central Texas uh, uh, schools. 
Uh, we, we teach exclusively in Spanish. We call ourselves not a bilingual education program, but, uh, but a, a, a cultural and revitalization project is what we are, because we want to revitalize. And this is in an age of, uh, of, of a tremendous hostility. I mentioned not only the, um, you know, the, the, the crises that come from gentrification, but it's also the ice raids in Austin, Texas, as the ice raids that are um, you know, just tearing our, our families apart that are deporting um, uh, some of our, that have deported some of our parents. It's really um, a very difficult time right now in which we're doing our work, but, um, uh, you know, but we, we've really been able to see our value added when our own teachers, who themselves, some of them have suffer, suffered the effects of um, similarly of being separated from parents that have been deported, getting re-traumatized. And so we've had, we've had uh, uh, whole professional developments where we've just uh, had um, ceremony. We've had sweats and we've done uh, songs and prayers, the indigenous songs and prayers, and just to heal because of just how, how painful, how painful and how difficult and, and uh, really just awful it's been for our community these past couple of years. So our vision, this is, you know, everything is democratic and, you know, it's co-constructed, it's uh, everybody's involved. It's, we, we, we arrive at, at uh, consensus uh, as a community is to honor our community's cultural heritage, foster a social justice consciousness, and reclaim our collective identity in pursuit of educational freedom. Educational freedom, I mean, that's very powerful, right? It means, it means our, our education isn't free, right? Our knowledge, it's not free. Our language isn't free. Our culture isn't free. Our, it's, it's all in jail, right? Well, if all of that's in jail, you're in jail, right? And so we want freedom, libertad, right? But, but I mean, I've mentioned these great things, transcendence, right? We want transcendence, we want rejuvenation, we want to be like the eagle, you know, we want to fly high, and, and we want to have the, the 360 degree vision of the eagle, where, where we become um, you know, the, uh, analysts that can like, survey a problem, but then zero in you know, with, the, pre, with the, the, powerful, the, the powerful capacities of the eagle to, to get its prey. Right? I mean, that's like the kind of knowledge and intelligence and critical thinking and, and grasp that this next generation needs to have if we're going to tackle climate change, if we're going to tackle all the problems that we have right now. Uh, Dr. Emilio Zamora, Zamora uh, develops curriculum for us, and he does a great, a great job. So, so we're beginning our Grow Your Own project, and so this is just a visual, and nothing's... Um, been decided, but the idea is to grow our own educators and to use the feeder pattern. And the, the uh, jagged lines are all the different moments in, in the pathway that our kids would get access to, um, to ethnic studies curriculum, right? So right now in the fourth and fifth grade, they get it. Um, and, and everything that we produce is available district-wide. We've probably prepared about 100, at least 100 teachers in the curriculum, and uh, mostly at the elementary grade level, but it's in English and Spanish in uh, almost every grade except, I think, senior year in, in the Austin Independent School District. So you can provide services to a small number of students and still have you know, broad district-wide impacts. And so, I mean, the, you know, here's some more images. It's, um, it's an architecture. It's um, a, a different way of, uh, of, of living and being and doing in the world that, um, I mean, first it was the community-based organization that got it launched, and the whole idea was not for us. Uh, we call ourselves Nuestro Grupo, our group. It wasn't for us to like hold on to this, but the idea was to, was to get, like, get it going, right? And then, like, and then to gift it, to gift it to the teachers and let the teachers have ownership and control over it. And so I'm so happy to say that, that that's exactly, uh, it's taken time, but that's exactly what's happened. And, um, uh, and it's also a, a, a site for, for research, so we have dissertations that will be coming out of this, um, and some of my own uh, writing as well is, is already uh, a, a part of this. Um, <clears throat> someday, this will just be called a good education. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your conversations and your questions. So let's go ahead and get started. I'll um, read some of the questions that we have here. Um, so Dr. Valenzuela, first question here is, um, what are some of the results that you're seeing when it comes to ethnic studies and similar curriculum with regard to student achievement and student outcomes? Yeah, uh, so this is what, exactly what I testified on in the court case. And so this involved uh, looking at um, 30, 40 years of data, a lot of it case study research, a lot, uh, other uh, quantitative, uh, quasi-experimental design. 
Uh, and so if you look at Christy Sleater's work, that's qualitative. What, what you get is a lot of qualitative research that shows that it helps, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, a, a stronger sense of belonging, it promotes academic achievement, but uh, clearly with the Cabrera and the Penner um, uh, pieces, also the Francesca Lopez, what we see is that students that take ethnic studies courses, that uh, they're, it, uh, it, it reverses the impact of, uh, of not wanting to attend school. All of a sudden, it, you have better attendance, you have better grades, uh, students uh, are less likely to drop out. And what you see in the uh, Arizona case in particular was uh, higher rates of uh, college matriculation. So it really encourages a, a sense of yourself that is enhanced because you realize that it's your academic identity that has really gotten a boost because you've been um, educated in a way or miseducated in a way that, that, uh, that makes this curriculum um, mysterious and difficult. Um, when all of a sudden, when you take this, these courses, you, you realize that I too can be college material. I too can, can read critical texts and derive meaning from them. So, I mean, it, but what we know from the National Association for, for, for Multicultural Education, if you look at the name standards, what is really being impacted there is students' academic self-concept, their academic engagement. Um, and so it, it, that's really what we need to, to impact. And so when students have that experience of being successful in a curriculum that speaks to them, that excites them, that helps them to feel part of the grand American narrative, that's where, you, where you're going to get all of, this, um, all, all of these wonderful outcomes. So next question is about how you might have students from different backgrounds um, who attend um, school or after school programs or weekend programs about their own culture, but um, on their own time and their own, their own dime, like Jewish children going to Hebrew school, or um, the question here, Korean children going to Korean school. Um, and this questioner asked, quote, Italians, Japanese, and Chinese have all integrated into the American melting pot without help from public school ethnic programs. Why should public funds be used? Why are Hispanics different than other races, end quote? Well, they're part of the public, right? And, um, and so, um, uh, and I think that all of that should be taught. I mean, it's not like it has to be either or. I think communities have to come forward and make demands, right? And so for the longest time in uh, Mexican American history, the question always was whether, well, should we be, um, uh, you know, have a public identity or uh, a private one. And so, I mean, that was resolved in the 1960s and the 1970s is that we have a right to a public Mexican-American identity because we are the progeny of people that have always been here, right? It, even if our genes traveled all over the, the continent and, and uh, uh, the world, our people were here and they're still here and they stayed. And the kind of, of uh, learning and instruction is really just, um, I mean, not only to, to result in all these positive outcomes, but, but to actually treat a community that is part of this land, that is part of uh, this history in a respectful manner. It's simply respectful and it honors, it honors the people who, and the communities that have always been here. So no, I think, I mean, let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, I, 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 I think it's great to teach all of these areas. And, and in fact, our work with Academia Cuautli was very much inspired by um, the um, uh, Asian American and the Jewish American communities that have Saturday schools. The only thing that's different with us is that we want to transform public education and ultimately higher education as well. Um, and so that we're doing this through a partnership, right? So it's a partnership between our community center, the city of Austin, uh, and it gets signed by the mayor, right? Uh, and also the um, uh, school district, and then our community-based organization uh, called Nuestro Grupo. So it's through that partnership that, and it's not a charter school, right? It's through a partnership that we're able to um, provide um, uh, much value to the district and supports in all of these ways that uh, we hope will uh, translate into uh, very, very positive academic outcomes. Thank you. And the next question is, what are more concrete steps that school districts can take to lead our schools into this diverse paradigm shift? I've mentioned partnerships. Um, uh, you know, there's people on the ground. There's community centers in most places, a lot of places. They're underutilized. Uh, you have places where you, know, you have artists, uh, people that want to provide that nourishment because they're not getting, the kids aren't getting the nourishment in the public education system. I would say do, do uh, mapping, you know, find out what your opportunities are locally in terms of communities, organizations. What you can also do is, is do what we did. We, we, um, 
Uh, and this is the University of Texas. I direct a policy center. So the Texas Center for Education Policy, what we did was we, we actually organized a convening in September 20th, 2013. And uh, the conversation was, uh, and we brought uh, artists, historians, elders, um, teachers, um, uh, children's book advocates. You know, they exist. You know, people who um, advocate for inclusion in the curriculum at, at the smallest um, of ages because th there's just not a lot of diversity in textbooks or in books that come out of uh, mostly the Northeast. And so what we did was we, it was very organic. We like organic food, don't we, right? You know, why aren't we green? Why aren't we green uh, or more green in our educational systems and context? So, so I mean, what, we, what you can do is, is uh, I mean, we're totally organic. We, we uh, uh, just like the film suggested, you know, we got people together into a room and they, they told us, well, this is the crisis that we're having. We don't have enough curriculum. We don't have materials. And, and, and then uh, we've been meeting every Wednesday since. We meet every Wednesday, just like church, you know. <laughs> we, meet, we meet every Wednesday. And uh, Nuestro Grupo, we... Um, we're able to, um, to to carry forward all of the tasks that are associated with uh, keeping the program alive. And we also deal with policy issues and uh, at different levels, uh, at the city and the legislature and the school district. We're the primary group that advocated for um, uh, ethnic studies in uh, the school district. And, uh, and then also where we are with the city, there's always different kinds of city politics involved. And so it, it's, it's a little bit more than just sort of the, 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 the instrumental task and goal of um, providing a culturally enriching curriculum that is uh, available to all kids district-wide. And that would be sufficient, but, bec but because of the nature of the crises that we're having and, uh, and also because of the opportunities that we have as Austin with our artist community, with, um, you know, with uh, a lot of people wanting to be part of this, that uh, that we're able to to craft something that's that's unique to our own space. Too much of what we get is is prefabricated and top down, and right, and 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 um, I mean, too much of what what we're having to do in education is like not authentic at all. And so we we need to break down these barriers and really, really, you know, get into our communities, into our artist communities, uh, you know, work with our librarians and our elders. Um, in order to uh, you know begin refashioning things, I mean that's grassroots democracy. Okay, we have a tradition in this country of grassroots democracy, and that's what people do. We started out meeting in people's homes, okay, and then in restaurants, and then finally we ended up at the Mexican American Culture Center. So I mean, I, there's a lot of ways to do this. And the last question is, I'm going to combine these two. One one part of the the first part concerns a system level look and second is about the individual. So the system part of the question is, how do we achieve this representation in curriculum at scale while also ensuring that there's an adequately trained talent pool, teachers and other educators to implement this? And then the second is from an educator's perspective, um, if you have an educator who um, is white or is who, who might not share the exact same um, background or cultural or ethnic background, how can educators begin to um, advocate for and begin this journey of helping students understand their own uh, backgrounds and identities? You know, there's a lot that's been written about this. Uh, I would go to rethinking schools. There's lots of narratives about like white teachers working with, with um, uh, minority communities. Uh, there's a lot that's been written on this, a lot that is being done right now. But you know, if, the way I think about it is if I were gonna be a, a teacher in an African American, you know, segregated school, um, it, I would want to know, uh, I mean, just off the bat, I would want to know African American literature, African American history. I'd want to know the leadership. I'd like to know the context. I want to be connected to the parents. I'd like to know about about the African American community organizations. I would be involved. I wouldn't like be you know parachute in. I would live in the community where I'm teaching. That that's how I, that would be. You know, like just you know, my, my modus operandi to just be as part of it and, and, and never with the hope that I would be uh, necessarily uh, the hope that I would be a, an, an effective teacher as determined by the community itself. But if that were to happen, that would be a, a uh, you know, a fantastic outcome of my, my career to be recognized as someone who, who is in solidarity, right? I mean, I think solidarity is a really good word for what, what I'm talking about. And so it's not just sort of dealing with, you know, dealing with this child and this child and their family. It's dealing with their community, it's their, the, the history and the burden of that history. Um, I mean, it, it's, I mean we, we've done Know Your Rights clinics. We brought attorneys 
to the parents so that they can get assistance with the, uh, situations in case they get separated. Can you imagine being a parent, you yourself, and having to deal with these possibilities that, that uh, you know, from one day to the next you could be without your, your, your child, you could be in, in jail, you could be in prison. So, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, it's deeper than probably most of us are accustomed Right, and but I don't really see a shortcut, and also I don't have, I don't see personally anything more gratifying. There's nothing more to me. That's the biggest kept secret that all all of this uh, you know this granular detailed work that I'm talking about is is um, it, it's it's very fulfilling, right? If I mean you're either involved in community and you can you're concerned about community welfare. Or, or you're not, and and if you're and, and if you're not, then I think the answer is different, right? But if you are, well, you have to be humble, right? You have to have epistemic humility, and and being of the same race alone doesn't necessarily cut it, right? Of the same race or ethnic group, because you still are different, and you're privileged, and you have status, and you come from the university, and so you enter spaces um, with epistemic humility, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, you gotta be humble, right? I mean, we can't act like we know it all. And I see, and I see a community as, as, as an afterthought in research, as an afterthought in what you know, higher education institutions want to do, or even what districts want to do. It's like the community is irrelevant, right? Well, I think we need to like turn that on its head. And, and, and so we need to you know, really like work in solidarity with our community-based organizations or form an organization that wants to work uh, in a humble way with our communities, not because they're humble, but because we're arrogant, right? We're epistemically close-minded. I mean, the, the, the attributes that we want out of an ethnic studies program, or really any program, is, is that we want to be, we want to be open-minded. We, you know, we want to be intellectually curious, right? We want to be curious. And, and we want to be humble and not act like we know it all. And that's the big, and, and, they, and they can sniff you out. You go to the Texas State Legislature and you, you, know, you try to flaunt your credentials and your degrees, that won't even work in that space. And that's our community. Those are our legislators, right, that are trying to represent us. They have no use for that, right? They don't, they don't want us to work with them in that way because they need help. Our schools need help, right? And so we have to really think about our posture and how we are and who we are in the world, I think in a really different way. It's like we're not going to go save these people, right? I mean, that's off the bat not the right, the right posture. In fact, more than likely, it, it, it that is going to save us. Mm -hmm. It's probably the other way around if we allow it to. All right, Dr. Valenzuela, again, thank you so much for sharing your remarks with us today. Thank you.